Me, I'm Alex White. I'm Director General here at the Institute of International European Affairs. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here uh, this afternoon, members of the Diplomatic Corps, um, loyal members and supporters of the Institute. Um, our Chair, Chairman Fer Fergal O'Rourke is with us, other members of the Board of the Institute. Um, as I said, members of the Diplomatic Corps in particular, I welcome the French Ambassador. Vincent, you're welcome. Regular visitor here. I'm delighted to have you. We're really delighted to be joined uh, this afternoon by Edouard Philippe, who is a uh, mayor of Le Havre and former prime minister of um, our closest EU neighbour, France. Um, um, Monsieur Philippe will speak to us for maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll leave that up to him. There's no, it's not rigid, which, you know, in or about that. And then we'll have a QA and a and some engagement. So we'll be, I know um, Edouard would be happy to take some questions or observations, perhaps sometimes observations that are masquerading as questions and sometimes questions masquerade as, as observations, but we'll be quite flexible in relation to that in the interest of having a discussion and a good interaction. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion the usual way. If you want to ask a question or say something, you'd always put up your hand. Please tell us who you are. If you don't mind, your name is, is great. And if you have a designation or an organization and you don't mind telling us that, please do so. Um, if you're watching us on Zoom or, uh, or watching us uh, yeah, through Zoom, uh, you can use the Q&A function there. So more than welcome. Uh, looking at the camera, more than welcome if you're at home to uh, to use the Zoom to ask a question. And if something occurs to you in the course of the presentation or at any point, just put it into the Q&A because there's no point in everybody all rushing together at the end. Uh, the Q&A, the presentation and the Q&A are both on the record and you can join through uh, social media on X, if you like, or other social media using the hashtag at IIEA. And we're also live streaming this afternoon's uh, discussion. So welcome to everybody who's joining us through YouTube. Uh, this is a most interesting year for elections all around the world, not least in France, where of course there's been a, an election, the two rounds, uh, the second one having been completed 10 days ago, uh, where as a result of which there was, I was gonna say an uncertain outcome, but a clear outcome, but, but an uncertain uh, uncertainty about what's going to happen next. And I think uh, we couldn't have a better a guest a speaker uh, to give us some insight into perhaps what he thinks might happen next. Perhaps he might even tell us what he thinks should happen next, but we'll leave that to him. Um, but it's a good opportunity for us to reflect on the French election. We're very interested in France here in the Institute. We have many events uh, looking at France, taking interest in France. Of course, Ireland-French relations are very important for all kinds of reasons. So the French election is really important for France, but it's also important for Europe and for uh, the wider world. So we're very interested in talking about that. Edouard Philippe um, has been mayor of Le Havre since 2010. Uh, from 2012 to 2017, he was also a member of parliament uh, representing the 7th district of Saint-Maritime. From 2017 to 2020, he served as prime minister of France. In October 2021, he created his own political party, uh, Horizons. And in November 2021, he was elected president of the International Network of Port Cities, also of interest to us. Edouard Philippe is also a writer who has published several novels and nonfiction books. So um, the terrific uh, guest. We're so delighted to have Edouard Philippe with us this afternoon. Please give him a warm welcome. Hello, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, everyone. Uh, I've been asked to uh, deliver a speech in English on the following subject. The place of France and the EU in the face of a global upheaval. That's a very good subject, way better than my English. But um, let, let, let me start by quoting a, a writer I, I love very much, who's not Irish, but he's not French either. Uh, he's called Jared Diamond. Maybe a lot of you know him. Maybe you don't know him, but he's a very good writer. And he wrote several books, um, Collapse, wonderful books on, on, on environment and, and, and natural resources. And he wrote an even better book, which, which is called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And if you didn't read that book, well you know what to buy the next time you'll go to a library. It's a wonderful book. And he wrote another book. His last book is called Upheaval. 
which is a good thing, given the title of this conference, how nations cope with crisis and change. And in the introduction, he writes, and I quote, it's neither possible nor desirable for individuals or nations to change completely and to discard everything of their former identities. The challenge for nations as for individuals in crisis is to figure out which parts of their identities are already functioning well and don't need changing and which parts are no longer working and do need changing. This is what he calls selective change. Today, France and the European Union are facing, are facing a global upheaval. And so we should ask what are our forces and what selective changes we should implement in order to improve the situation. To quote Churchill in one of his unmistak unmistakable expressions, never let a good crisis go to waste. And that's a good news because we have a lot of very good crises to deal with. Um, everyone knows here that the crisis is as it, uh, its Greek etymology indicates, a moment of truth, a turning point that represents both a challenge and an opportunity. That's a good reminder to look for the silver lining in times of upheaval and to look for opportunities where they may not have been before. Bearing in mind Jared Diamond's analysis through the prism of selective change, I would like to make a few comments on that subject. And, and, and start by saying that we are living in a very, we, we are living in a world which is changing at a tremendous rate, so fast and so um, in, intensely, I would say. And I would, I would you know, point out four major changes that we have to face. Very simple one that we have to face. The first major changes we have to face is a demographic one. And it's, it's certain, it's there, but it's a major change we have to face. Um, it took humanity a long time to get to 1 billion people living on Earth. It was uh, the case as soon as the uh, 18... The beginning of the 19th century. I was born in 1970. In 1970, there were 3.7 billion humans living on Earth. We are close to, I don't know, 8 billion people living on Earth right now. And everything that we read say that at the end of the century will be more like 10 billion even though it's not absolutely sure. Um, currently, there is one people on the north of the Mediterranean shore in Europe for two people on the south of the Mediterranean shore in Africa. One for two. This ratio is going to change dramatically in the 50 years to come. And we're going to be one people in the north of the Mediterranean shore against, or not against, four or five people on the south of the Mediterranean shore. So one for five in 30 or 40 years from now. And, and the one guy who will be up north will be old, whereas the five on the south will be young. Of course, it's a statistic. So, But that means we are living in a world that is already changing very, very, very far, very fast. So demographic change is are already changing our world. The second aspect of the change I wanted to speak about is technology. Technology has always changed the world since the wheel. It has always changed the world. But what we see now is a, is a change on a dimension, on a scale that has never been so huge with uh, interf uh, uh, in artificial intelligence. I'm sorry, if I were to speak French, I would be so much more intelligent. I mean, I would look so precise. You know, it would be another story. 
but I will stick to English. Uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence is changing the world and will change the world in a way we don't imagine. Everything we know might be different. What is freedom? What is work? What is decision making? We don't know what it is with artificial intelligence. We don't know how much it's going to change our way of living. We know that it's going to change, but we don't know how much it's going to change. Um, biotechnologies are literally changing the way we live and will change the way we live. So I don't want to get into specifics. It's not the point, but I just want to stress how much our world is changing given the technological and biotechnological changes that we are now facing. Just, just one remark on technological changes. Because, you know, people say, well, l'intelligence artificielle, it's not that, you know, it's, it, you, you shouldn't worry. And maybe we shouldn't worry. I don't know. But recently I spoke with a very, very huge guy on this uh, technology. And he told me something which is very interesting. He told me, the problem is not what we know we can do or what we don't know, we still don't know we can do. The problem is what we know we will not be able to do. And for instance, he told me, we know that we are not certain to be able to construct an, uh, an intelligence artificial that cannot learn how to protect itself. Because IA works with humans and learn with humans. And if they learn with humans, at some point, they might learn how to protect themselves from humans. They know we, 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 we design intelligence artificial able to cheat rules. We cannot be sure that we won't be able to produce an intelligence artificial that is not able to protect itself. Can you imagine the scope of such a simple truth? I cannot. Um, so technology is the second major factor which is changing our world. The third factor is, of course, environment. And I'm, I don't think it's very necessary to develop that idea. But, but, but truly, climate change is doing something to the Earth that we cannot uh, uh, um, écarté. Put aside. put aside exactly we cannot put aside that um, and it's a major change and of course uh, it creates it creates new conditions on earth it creates new problems for humanity it creates new uh, uh, um, uh, uh, tendencies uh, uh, all over the world so environment is the third factor the fourth factor would be China, I would say. I would, I would, you know, propose to say that the fourth huge changing factor of the world is China. The the, the incredible rise of China. You know that um, when um, when uh, uh, the former how do you call it? The former minister of foreign affairs, American. Kissinger, when Kissinger first went to China at the beginning of the, I think the first time he went to China would be very, very early in the 70s. Soissandouz, yes. The first time he went there was 72. And, and he, he recently he said that if in 72, someone had told him that China would uh, live half the changes mm -hmm. that China has known, he wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> so the growth of China is incredible by human standards. When I say that, I say that in, in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 50 years, China had its industrial revolution, its digital rev revolution, its um, a certain amount of political revolution also. And, and, and just to get the figures right, remember that uh, beginning in, the, in 2002, every two years, every two years, 
China creates more wealth than the old GDP of India. The growth of China is bigger than the GDP of India. Remember that China used every two years from 2002 to today more concrete than the all of the United States during all the 20th century. <laughs> That's the kind of, of and, and the, those are very simple figures and, and, and indications. But the growing power of China and the, uh, the, the pace at which China has become the other superpower and wants to become the only superpower is something that in history of the world has not been seen. It has not been seen at such a rate and with such intensity. And it's changing the world for the better, I'm not sure, or for the worse, it might be, but it's changing fundamentally the equilibrium of the world. So I don't want to be longer on those four uh, factors, on those four changing, uh, uh, on those four evolutions. But, um, but I would say that in such a world, what is absolutely certain is that we're better off with Europe than without. And that we profoundly need Europe in such a world. Um, we need Europe to hold our own standing against the American and Chinese blocs. And of course, I don't <laughs> equate those two blocs. Uh, I mean, we have very good relationship with the United States. Obviously, Ireland has incredibly close relationship with the United States, but France has also very good relationship with the United States. It's one of the few country in the world which we never uh, went to war uh, against, well, at war against, well, we went at war. Um, and, and, and of course we have a, a shared common and cherished history. But, at, and, and we don't have bad relation with China. Good relation with the US, not bad relation with China. But at the end of the day, China and the US have their own interests. It's quite normal. Uh, and uh, they want to defend and affirm their own interests. If we want to stand firm against American power and against Chinese ambition, and if we want to be relevant in a world that is increasing, increasingly polarized and deregulated, we must be strong, united, influential, and cohesive. So we need, we need Europe. And we did even strongly because, and I want to stress that, our vision of the world is challenged. Um, if I may, I would say that for the last maybe 100 years or 70 years, our vision of the world has been standing on three pillars. The first pillar was that the idea that liberal democracy was the best way to ensure prosperity and stability. Of course, within Europe, there were political parties that would say liberal democracy is a myth, doesn't exist, it has to be fighted against. But at the end of the day, we were believing in Europe and in other parts of the world that liberal democracies were the best way to ensure the general prosperity and the political stability. This belief is challenged. It's very much challenged. It is challenged by authoritarian countries. It is challenged in uh, the Gulf. It is challenged in Asia. It is challenged sometimes in South America, where leaders say, well, I'm sorry, but liberal democracy don't ensure the prosperity of everyone and don't ensure the political stability. President Xi would very easily pretend and does pretend that the Chinese authoritarianism is the best way to ensure the collective prosperity and the political stability, reducing civil liberties and individual liberties within the private uh, uh, household, household. 
So our way of seeing liberal democracy as the best way to ensure prosperity and, and, and political stability is challenged. The second pillar we were working on was multilateralism. The simple idea that, well, not, not that simple, but <laughs> the idea that when we have to face a problem in the world, the best way would be to have a common rule and common instruments in order to make that rule uh, prevail. That's the reason for the UN, that's the reason for the GATT, that's the reason for every kind of multilateral organizations. Those organizations and this idea of multilateralism is also very much fighted against right now. A lot of country doesn't believe in it, don't believe in it, and believe that it doesn't work, it doesn't guarantee their rights, it's a machine made by the West in order to ensure the rules decided by the West. Um, and, and so, um, and we see country, nations, governments that prefers action, individual action, non-multilateral actions with the use of, of strength, of force, in order to ensure their interests. So multilateralism, which seemed at the end of the 80s, the future of the world, has almost disappeared. Almost. Almost. And the third vision, the third pillar of our vision of the world is that we, in the West and we, European, have always thought that we were at the center of things. Our maps would design Europe as the center of things. We, we, we would, and, and even, even though after 45, we were not the superpower, there was an East against the West. Well, we were at the center. And the truth is we are no longer at the center, not at all. The world has changed because of China, because of Asia, because of a lot of factors, because of we are not at the center of things. We are increasingly getting uh, put aside at the periphery of the world. It's very, it's, it's, it's not something we like to uh, uh, admit. And maybe okay. we like to pretend that we are still, because of our culture, because of our prosperity at the center of the world. But we are no longer. We are put aside by other superpowers at the edge of the world, at the periphery of the world. So the world is changing fast and the three pillars of how we see the world are disappearing. One more reason to say that we need Europe in order to come back or at least to stand and to stand surely in the world. We need uh, Europe to be a force against China and America. We need Europe to counter the American Inflation Reduction Act. I would like to say a few words on that because um, within the last two or three years, it's probably um, uh, it's probably the, the, the decision taken by an ally which has harmed us the most and which has um, uh, created the most important risk uh, for the transatlantic relation, I think. Um, the United States is a sovereign state, of course, and it does as it please. But the Inflation Recovery Reduction Act is undermining German chemistry, it's eroding the foundations of Europe competitiveness, and it's hindering the European industrial revival. It is striking when you go to Germany, when you go to the Netherlands, when you go to uh, the Republic Czech, it is striking to see how many European industrial companies are wondering whether they should go to the United States to invest, and they do. And so if we want to have an industrial base, if we want to defend our industrial base, and we need an industrial, strong industrial base, we need to find something in order to block or to counter this American move. 
of course, my I don't say that we have to be. Uh, I, I don't want to be an enemy of the United States. Of course, I mean I want to be an ally of the United States. I want the United States to be an ally of Europe. But what I'm seeing with the Inflation Reduction Act is something which puts in peril our industrial base and something we have to be able to counter uh, or to uh, uh, attenuate, hmm? to alleviate, alleviate. I mean, there's the impression that everyone speaks French here. I don't see why I should be the only one speaking English. Uh, we need Europe to manage the migrant to, to manage migration flows. The truth is there is no scenario where we can address migration issues without a powerful, coordinated, ambitious European policy. None. It doesn't exist. Even though some of the government in Europe pretend that Europe is a concern as far as migration are uh, taken in, into account. Although some governments pretend that they can alone implement a very strong policy which could you know, alleviate the problems of migrations. The truth is there is absolutely no solution to that question without a coordinated, strong, and efficient European policy. We need it. And I say that, I'm saying that in Dublin, and Dublin is certainly not the part of Europe which is the most concerned by migration uh, issues. Even though I um, must say that since my arrival last Monday, I've been asked many questions on that issue. And I've seen that a lot of uh, political elected officials were thinking about what it changes or what it should change in, uh, in, in the policies, uh, in the Irish policies. But anyway, we need that European might as far as, as, as long as uh, we are facing those migrations. And of course, when I say that, I don't say that we don't want migrations. We need new students. We need new labor force. We need uh, a world which is more open. So of course, I'm, I'm not against the principle of migrations, but I must stress that there is no solution for Europe if Europe cannot implement a policy that Europe decides and government decides uh, when it take when in when in when we are speaking about migrations, we cannot assist. We cannot look at migrations. We cannot uh, just uh, see the results of individual decisions. We cannot uh, uh, just look at the problems uh, created by migrations. We have to implement a policy which allows us to choose who is able to come, who is not able to come. And we cannot do that unless we have a strong European policy, coordinated policy. And I must say that for the first time since very, very, very long time, I'm quite optimistic about that because the um, migration plan that was adopted by the European Parliament a few months ago is probably the first time we are um, uh, giving a chance to have the instruments and the human power uh, and resources uh, in order to implement a real uh, uh, migration policy. Um, we need Europe to propose a credible model of decarbonized economic growth. Um, decarbonized growth, green industry, call it whatever you want to call it, but this idea is that we need to make Europe a commercial and industrial power concerned with preserving the planet, concerned with moving towards rapid decarbonization. Um, we are, in fact, probably the only vast, uh, not nation, but group of nations in which this idea is so, um, uh, is, is put as such a, 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 an important place in the public debate. Of course, in China, they are looking at this issue. Of course, in Japan, they are sensitive to this issue. Of course, in the United States, they don't say that there is no issue. But in the whole world, I, I, I don't see another continent that would be doing so much for decarbonization and that would be doing so much in order to create a, a, a green growth 
or uh, uh, an adaptation to the to the climate change. Uh, once again, no single European state will be able to commit to it effectively by itself. And if we want to have an impact, if we want to be able to organize this transition, if we want to be able to find a market, if we want to be able to resist pressure from other powers, we will have to rely on a coordinated Europe that will build this transition to decarbonize the economic growth. That is something we are doing and we could do better still. And we need Europe for much more. We need Europe to fight hybrid threats with more tools than a purely military alliance, to show the way on regulation on internet big players and of the new digital battlefields. We need to organize Europe's agriculture power in a world where food and access to water are and will become even more essential issues in the years to come. We we'll need Europe to build our future, to enhance our academic excellence. There's a, a lot of stake. The French president Emmanuel Macron used to speak about autonomous, autonomous strategy. Ah, yeah, strategic autonomy, it's, it's, it's much better this way. Uh, strategic autonomy, he's right. He's absolutely right. We have to think about Europe as a whole, which has to be autonomous, which has to have a strategy, and we have to decide by itself how it wants to live. And it's not only on defense issues. It is on defense issues. And we have to stay with NATO, and we have to build something with NATO. But it's not only on defense issues. We have to select the few technologies that we know we have to master. Because if others master them before we do, we are cooked. We are no longer relevant. And, and, and the risk is, is right now. It's not for 20 years from now. It's, it's right now. Um, Ambassador Guerrero told me, I didn't know the figure before he told me that, but it's a good figure that on the, on the planet, only 6% of the supercalculators, you know, the top calculators of the world, are in Europe, based in Europe. You don't want to compete with China and the US if you don't have the state-of-the-art technology. You know that it's going to be a mess if you don't. So on some subjects, maybe it's space, maybe it's AI, maybe it's, you know, we have to organize our autonomy. We have to sync with this uh, autonomy strategic. Okay? <sighs> Next time I will do that in France. Um, so as a, as a French, as a French citizen, as a French politician, I'm of course determined to reinforce my country's role and influence on the international scene. But uh, I know that uh, willing to be uh, to I'm, I'm I'm too much a patriot to be willing to isolate my country from what makes it stronger. And what makes it stronger is the EU. Um, so we need unity, we need mutual support, we need trust to withstand the turmoil of our time. We need to be united in diversity to quote the fine European motto. We need Europe. And I think we need more Europe. So um, that's what I wanted to say. Maybe not as clearly as I would have liked it uh, but uh, after two days in 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 Ireland, uh, I'm losing my French and I'm not winning my English. So thank you very much.